The Bugatti we know today produces hypercars that are nearly unmatched by any other company in terms of pure performance, luxury, and high quality craftsmanship. Bugatti truly lives by its motto that if it's comparable, it's not a Bugatti. In this video, we'll be taking a look at Etor Bugatti, the visionary genius behind some of the most iconic cars in history and the founder of a legendary hypercar company. This is Automotive Icons, where I take a look at the lives and innovations of pioneers in the automotive industry. Give the video a like to see more and let me know who you want me to cover next in the comments below. Our story starts on September 15th, 1881, when Etor Arco Isidoro Bugatti was born in Milan, Italy. The Bugatti family has a deeply entrenched artistic background with several notable architects, designers, and artists throughout history. Etor's father, Carlo Bugatti, was trained as an architect but started designing and manufacturing his own furniture and jewelry lines with which he did fairly well for himself. As Etor grew up, his father recognized not only his artistic talent that was so prevalent in the family but that Etor also had a predilection towards engineering. In his teenage years, Etor worked on repairing and building motorized bicycles and tricycles, which largely preceded automobiles. Carlo pushed Etor to pursue an apprenticeship at Italian manufacturer Pernetti and Stucchi when he turned 16, so that Etor could further his engineering skill. After working at Stucchi for about a year, Etor had finished developing his very own motorized tricycle and entered it into the long-distance Paris-Bordeaux race. He then spent another year honing his skills and his efforts resulted in the Type 1, which he finished before the turn of the century, and then he followed that up with the Type 2 in 1901. His mechanical prowess for the emerging automotive industry hadn't gone unnoticed, and in 1902, Etor took an engineering position at the German manufacturer De Dietrich, which was starting to dabble in cars. Bugatti moved up to the Alsace region of what was then Germany but would eventually become part of France and that region has also always been known for its unique blend of German and French culture which gave Etor a lot of inspiration for the main themes and other motifs behind his car design. Etor was the production director for several more cars during his time with Dietrich which lasted about 7 years. In 1909, Etor, with his newlywed wife Barbara, moved to the town of Mosselheim, which is still in the Alsace region, and he officially founded Automobiles e Bugatti. Back then, really the only way for a fledgling automaker to get its name out there was by winning races, so that's what Etor set out to do, and within the first couple of years of Bugatti's founding, he had bagged a win at the French Grand Prix and went on to dominate the Grand Prix category. He used his manufacturing connections to collaborate with Peugeot on the Type 19 in 1913 and it seemed as though Bugatti's solo venture couldn't have gotten off to a better start, but turbulent times were around the corner with the onset of World War I. Bugatti, like other automakers, adapted to developing other types of machinery and Etor specifically put his focus on aircraft. While the first Bugattis used small four-cylinder engines, Etor's foray into aircraft led him to develop powerful and efficient 8- and 16-cylinder engines, which would alter the course of automotive history, with Etor emerging from the war a better engineer than ever before. Bugatti was now officially a French company after the war ended, and Bugatti started off the interwar era with big wins at Le Mans and Brescia, and went on to rack up over 400 victories by 1925. And it was this run that would ultimately cement Etor Bugatti in automotive history and brought us iconic models like the Type 35 and Type 37, both of which would be raced by Louis Chiron. During this time, Etor kept his son John close by and developed him with the hope that he would succeed Etor in leading the company. Bugatti was doing well financially as the luxury market grew during the economic boom following the war and he was able to expand the operations into other areas like rail cars and racing planes. But this period of time also marked the rise of true luxury cars that focused on more than speed and power like Mercedes and Maybach from Germany and Rolls Royce and Bentley from England. These marquees prompted Etor and his son to work on their ultimate monument of luxury, a project that would become the Bugatti Royale. 
Even today, with cars having grown steadily in recent decades, the Bugatti Royale stands out with its mammoth size. From end to end, the Royale is a foot and a half longer than the current Rolls Royce Phantom. Despite the Royale being a coupe, a huge factor in this massive length was an inline 8-cylinder that powered the car. Of course, the Royale was very expensive and developing an ultra-luxury car during the mid-20s sounded like a good idea, but as the stock market crashed in the US, an economic recession permeated the globe and the market for Bugattis began to evaporate. During this time, Etor's lack of customer service became apparent. When one customer complained about having trouble starting the car in the cold, Etor angrily replied that if the customer could afford a Bugatti, he could afford a heated garage. Another customer complained about poor braking capability, and Etor yelled, I make my cars to go, not stop. Like all automakers, Bugatti struggled throughout the Great Depression and a workers' strike in 1936 all but halted operations. Etor decided to take a break and move to Paris, leaving his son Jean in charge of the company. During his time at the head of Bugatti, Jean would develop the Type 57, which I personally consider to be one of, if not the most beautiful car ever made. The Type 57 was a success for the company and sold 100 times as many units as the Royale, along with winning Le Mans in 1939. However, shortly after this victory, Jean Bugatti took the Le Mans winning car out for a drive and while swerving to avoid a drunk bicyclist, he would end up in a fatal crash. Just as Etor had to step back into his leadership role of the company, World War II broke out and with Alsace bordering Germany, it became one of the first regions to fall under German control. Etor was told he could voluntarily hand over the company and its assets to Germany or it would be seized and sold at auction. So he handed over his life's work for a fraction of its value, only receiving 150 million francs. Etor moved back to Paris and endured the war while continuing to design cars and plotting his comeback. Unfortunately, in another blow to the Bugatti family, Etor's wife Barbara would pass away in 1944. As the war came to an end and France began to stabilize, Bugatti put together plans for a new factory in Levallois. Etor remarried and had two more children, but his dream of reviving automobiles Bugatti was dashed after he found out he was being charged with collaborating with the German government during the war because he had sold them the original company. And all of Bugatti's assets that were under German control had now been seized by the French government, with his Italian origins likely playing a role in his treatment as a criminal. The past several years had undoubtedly taken a toll on Etor's physical and mental health, leading to him spending the last months of his life holed up in his apartment, where he would eventually pass away in 1947. A couple of months after his death, he would be acquitted, and the remnants of automobiles e Bugatti would be released back to the family. The story of how Bugatti got to where it is today is a topic for another video, so let me know if you would like an in-depth look at how the rest of the Bugatti story played out. This is part of a series on the channel called Automotive Icons, so if you like this video, check out the Automotive Icons playlist and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.